Okay, we're live to tape. So John Stuart Mill was a relevant philosopher, not only in his day, where he was really what we would, in, in retrospect, call the first progressive, and you'll soon see why, but also because he was a child prodigy. I believe he was reading and writing Greek and Latin as well as English at a very young age, three, four, or five years old. Uh, he obviously was a very brilliant child, but he grew up to have a tremendous social conscience, and this uh, stemmed partly from his father's upbringing. His father was a pastor and also from a great friend of the family who was Mill's mentor in life, uh, a man named Jeremy Bentham. And I will <clears throat> enter that name now in the chat room so you can see how it's spelled, Jeremy Bentham. Now, Bentham was very important because he was the kind of forerunner of, of Mills, and he is the one who, in the greatest depth before Mill, propounded Mills' uh, social and political philosophy, which generally goes under the head of utilitarianism. Have any of you heard this name before? I'll type it in. Utilitarianism, does that ring a bell with any of you? You could just say in the chat room, it does, Randy, okay, that's fine. Some of you, Denise, yes, all right. So Jeremy Bentham is, there were a few people who were indeed forwarding, uh, promoting ideas of this sort, but Bentham was the primary source, uh, and he wrote a book on it. Uh, and the bumper sticker, if, you, if you're a utilitarian uh, and you want to uh, advertise yourself, you, your bumper sticker would probably read as follows. The greatest happiness for the greatest number. And that would be, uh, for obviously meaning the greatest number of people, yep. So the greatest happiness principle, in short, um, is, is the greatest happiness for the greatest number. And implicitly, it recognizes, as I'm sure you already realize, that we're not going to have a utopia. We're talking about the greatest number. Neither Bentham nor Mill nor, nor anyone in their day thought that you could always make everybody happy. Uh, remember, there was a, a, a very famous saying, and was it Lincoln or remind me of some other, I think it was President Lincoln or somebody who said around the same time, you can't please all the people all the time. You know, you can please some of the people some of the time, but you can't please all the people all the time. And you could try this at home. You'll see you can't please everybody. There's always going to be someone um, who's going to be unhappy. You could post a video and you could have a million likes. But there's always going to be somebody who dislikes it, right? There's always going to be somebody who's trolling you. It was Lincoln. Thank you, Denise. So, I mean, that's a recognition of, uh, I think, a much broader statement politically, which is perhaps the impossibility of attaining utopia. There's always someone who's going to be unhappy. But what they're doing is they're focusing on the positive and on the much larger positive. So Bentham and Mill, who was his successor as a utilitarian and rescued Bentham's theory from some of its most vociferous critics was also not a utopian. He was saying the best we can do is to achieve the greatest possible happiness for the greatest number of people, and that should be our task. And he's going to then tell us, uh, really, that's a theory of justice in a certain sense. A just society, in Mill's terms, certainly would be one in which the greatest number of people achieves the greatest possible happiness. And after all, uh, that's hard to disagree with. But you're going to see momentarily some of the severe criticisms to which one might subject this, and also how Mill answers them. So please get immediately that we have to actually delve into three texts in order to appreciate Mill and, and how Mill will defend his notion of the greatest happiness for the greatest number against the most severe criticisms. And I'll be explaining some of those this morning. And we'll continue with them on Thursday, and I hope you will in your other breakout lectures as well. So please realize that to understand Mill, and I, why do we want to understand Mill? Well, uh, because I think Mill is very relevant to our current times, and certainly his formulae have been adopted uh, by many democratic governments in various ways. He's a relevant philosopher. Not only did he write eloquently and, and convincingly and had a huge influence in America as well as, as in uh, England. But Mill also served in Parliament. He didn't just talk the talk, he walked the walk. 
So he was such an avid social and political reformer that he stood for election. He got elected once or twice, I think, served a couple of terms as a parliamentarian and therefore worked to implement changes in, in legislation in such areas as child labor, prison reform. Yes, exactly. Oh, you're ahead of me today, Denise. Good for you. I like it. Yes, I mean, the, the child labor laws were still very crude at that time and, and, and very harsh. So you will look back on this period where Mill is trying to change society peacefully by means of progressive laws, uh, and you will see other contrasting figures emerge from this very exciting artistic time. Not a great time to be a child in the working classes, but certainly a very interesting time for us to look back on this late Victorian period or mid to late Victorian period when Britain was the world power. Um, and uh, notwithstanding what history calls attention to, namely, I suppose, the, um, the kinds of injustices that occur uh, whenever there's a great empire that's forged, it's usually forged on the back of, uh, of some kind of exploitation or colonization or, you know, something else. Uh, nonetheless, uh, there are also internal problems. And the most uh, outspoken critics of these internal problems were Bentham and Mill on the side of utilitarian reform. But also you could read, and maybe some of you have read, the novels of Charles Dickens. Has anyone ever encountered Charles Dickens? I don't know if anybody's still reading him, but uh, yes, good. Well, I'm really glad because Dickens was was portraying some of the savage inequalities of the time and uh, and in, in through a literary genre was nonetheless very powerfully doing this, as was Victor Hugo in Paris. If you read Les Miserables, uh, you, will, you will see exactly this same thing unfolding in France. Great Expectations, Oliver Twist, uh, there are any any numbers any number of of the Dickens novels that are all dealing with this uh, Scrooge also the tale of Scrooge remember it comes from him so you you have that exponent and you also had Karl Marx at exactly the same time yes a Christmas Carol thank you Randy you you also have Karl Marx who's had I needn't remind you of the ongoing influence of Marx on the world. There have been Marxist revolutions of a major kind, both in Russia uh, and then in China. Uh, there uh, are cultural Marxists who've basically colonized most of the Democratic Party in this country, uh, who the so-called radicals among the Democrats are all Marxists one way or another. Uh, they're preaching a doctrine that was originated by Marx, and he was writing in London in the British Library exactly the same time. Uh, Marx's uh, formula was, as you may well, if you know, if you read him, a uh, violent overthrow of, of democratic governments and replacement and, and monarchies alike and replacement by, by, by some kind of a, uh, a uh, centralized uh, uh, communist party. And he was also uh, advocating for that in England. He, he worked for that uh, and didn't achieve it there yet. But in any case, you can imagine the, the ferment of ideas if you just transport yourself back. So you have John Stuart Mill, Charles Dickens, Karl Marx, and that's not all. Um, there were Charles Darwin uh, published on the origin of species right at the same time. Suddenly you had a biological theory for the first time that was giving us a coherent account of our origins uh, and so forth. So there was a lot of very interesting intellectual ferment in the air. And uh, from it, yes, that's right, well, natural selection uh, and, uh, and his uh, prediction of the science that we today call genetics, yes, that these small variations, as he called them, uh, were, were somehow going to be passed on, if favorable, would be passed on uh, to the next generation by some internal means that he guessed at, but in, 18, uh, in 1850s, they, they had no idea about how it was actually happening. So in any case, this is a very important period, in, uh, certainly in, in Western civilization. And what it gave rise to, um, by and large, is uh, you had Marxist revolutions in not, not the not very distant future. Uh, you had huge scientific breakthroughs in biology, um, thanks to the impact that Dickens had. 
Uh, you had all kinds of literature, which was agitating for social and political reform. And then you had the actual reformers from within the system, and Mill was one of those. So that contextualizes, I hope, some of his importance in the day. But as you're going to see from his writings, he, he's still relevant to us because of what he foresaw uh, and what he warned us against. So to understand Mill, uh, we really need to digest at least the core theses of three different works which are like strung together so many beads on a string to understand mill therefore i'm going to type this in we need to we need to get a handle on three things we need to to read the following which we're going to do this morning in brief utilitarianism obviously that's the reading in your textbook but also his essay on liberty, because one of the conditions of being happy, I'm going to tie this together immediately. I'm not going to keep you guessing. Right? If Mill is promoting the notion of the greatest happiness for the greatest number, which he is, then he also needs to be asking under what conditions is happiness itself best achieved, since we want a majority of people, as many people as possible, to be as happy as possible, and we think that's actually a task of governments to help co-create those conditions, then what does it mean, and under what kinds of conditions would people become as happy as possible, and how, you know, how can we get a majority or the, as many people as possible to become as happy as possible? Well, by giving them liberty, and the essay on liberty is therefore an absolute necessity to understand how the theory of utilitarianism plays out. Because to take the flip side of that, Mill would say, well, if you don't have liberties, if you don't have fundamental liberties, you can't be happy. Nobody can be happy if they're oppressed. Right? Is that is that a reasonable assertion? No one can be happy if they're being oppressed. No one can be happy if their if their liberties are taken away from them. No one can be happy if they if they're not in some sense free. Yeah, of course. I mean, that today might be common sense, but this is very important not to lose sight of. So when Mill's talking about the greatest happiness, the greatest number, between the lines, understand that a key component of your happiness, my happiness, everybody's happiness, is going to be liberty, of course, responsibly exercised. So in that essay on liberty, uh, and there are, there are extracts of it uploaded into your Google Drive folders, we will look at what kinds of liberties Mill wants to support and does. Uh, in order for us to be as happy as possible, we need to have as much liberty as possible. And what are the constraints? There have to be constraints because you already know that liberty can't mean everybody does exactly as they want all the time because that, that we know is a recipe for a Hobbesian state of nature. We've already seen that in Hobbes. You can't be free, you can't be free to do whatever you like. Uh, you have to have some, some constraint. We have to renounce right? our liberties at some point. We have to put a limitation. We have, we have to have liberty limiting principles. So Mill does a beautiful job of this on liberty. It's one of the greatest essays. If you like liberty, right, if you like individual liberty, then on liberty is, in my view, and I'm not alone in this, many scholars agree, it is the most eloquent defense of individual liberty ever written in the English language. And that essay, in part, is up there. It's only 100 pages and change. And the third component, some of you might already be wondering, if you're totally on the ball this morning, then you're going to immediately see why we need the third component as well, especially in Mill's day. Because the third book, and again, I put some of it up there for you to read, and I've highlighted some of it. These on liberty and this book I'm typing are not in your uh, assigned text. Uh, utilitarianism is. It's a book called The Subjection of Women. Uh, and in it, Mill calls very eloquently for the full emancipation, politically and socially, of women, for totally equal rights. And that was published in 1869. So he is actually a feminist, in addition to being a utilitarian and a great defender of individual liberty. And it should follow, it certainly follows rationally, that if you're going to argue that justice will be the greatest possible happiness for the greatest possible number, that in order to, to attain that happiness, we have to have individual liberties, and therefore it should follow that we can't have half the population disenfranchised and expect to attain this utilitarian goal. 
and expect that liberty should pertain only to, let's say, men, but not to women, right? It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be sensible, it wouldn't be fair. And so that's what Mill is arguing for. And you will also appreciate that he's ahead of his time. So when he said, and the subjection of women is the third thing, because obviously if half the population is, uh, is deprived of these fundamental liberties, then they're not going to be happy either. And so utilitarianism will fail. So in 1869, he publishes The Subjection of Women, calling for full political and social equality. And what's remarkable about that is it still took another 50 years for women to get the vote in England. I think it was around 1920, right? I mean, plus or minus, I believe the same in the USA. Some of you who are experts in this can correct me, but I believe that's the right time frame. It was after World War I. And, uh, and that's when the suffragette movement finally gained enough political sway uh, to have the laws changed, and women were then given the vote. And I believe the, the key date is 1919, 1920, 1921, in that period. So it, with someone like Mill uh, in a position of, of parliamentary uh, power, to whatever extent he had it, uh, and so he had a pulpit, and as a great author and, and a well-known philosopher, uh, it still took 50 more years for what he declared to be necessary to take effect. Uh, so I hope you already appreciate what an important voice he was. And it was not his voice alone. I would also hasten to add, before we dive into the text, that uh, he was very much influenced by his wife, Harriet Taylor. He credited her. Uh, she was also a philosopher, but in those days, uh, uh, women could not publish uh, women were not allowed to publish anything except poetry. Uh, but, you know, some of the most famous Victorian novelists took ma men's names, George Eliot being one. She had to take a man's name in order to be permitted to publish her novels because it was deemed to be unfeminine or scandalous for women to be writing novels for some reason. Uh, but those were the mores of the day. So Harriet Taylor, uh, Mill's wife, uh, who was also a philosopher, he says, which we, we don't know, but we read her uh, also between the lines of Mill, particularly since he, can, he credits her in the introduction to his work, I think particularly the subjection of women. This is, uh, this is a topic in which her influence is, is very clear. And he was very grateful to her um, for debating with him and for being, as it were, a silent partner in his writings. So that's a bit of a picture do you have any questions before we actually go to the text? I just wanted to contextualize for you and make absolutely clear that you can't just read utilitarianism, although it's a very important work on its own, but to make sense of Mill's theory of ethics and justice in a more full way, we really need to string together these three components. So does this, as presented, make sense to you? Are we okay so far? If you have any questions, please ask at this point. Renee is okay with this. Rachel's okay. All right, thank you. Anybody else okay? Are you following? Good. Denisa, Samson. All right, so I'm getting yeses, a lot of yeses. All right. I like it. If people are following and getting it, that's important. So when we look at utilitarianism, always in the back of your mind, remember that there are two other components which will contribute in a significant way to Mill's larger notion of what it means to be happy and what it, what it means, therefore, to attain the greatest happiness for the greatest number. All right. So now we're going to focus the microscope a little tighter and, and zoom in on, no pun intended, uh, we're going to zoom in on uh, utilitarianism. Uh, that, that's the component that's in your textbook. So we'll spend a little time with that. And uh, we may or may not get to the other two today. But by the end of the day, I certainly want to remind you, while he's talking about this greatest happiness for the greatest number thing, I want to remind you what he means by liberty. So I'm going to try and find a little time at the end, at least to focus on this one, chat, one, one, one important paragraph in the essay on liberty to see exactly what he means by liberty. And when you see what Mill means by it, I think you'll realize how modern he was uh, in his views, even back then which may to us seem a long time ago. All right, without further ado then, let's have a look. This is an extract that's in your text under the Ethics and Society chapter uh, called Utilitarianism. So I'm going to share the screen with you and we're going to look at some highlighted passages 
from that great work of Mills. Uh, bear with me while I uh, find the share screen option. Here it is. Um, and we have, with any luck, it's here. What happened? I'm sharing something. It's not the not the text at all. Hang on. Just bear with me. I thought I had pulled it up, but I guess not. Just bear with me. It doesn't seem to be. Let me try this one. Ah, that's better. Are you seeing utilitarianism now? Could someone say yes if they are? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so uh, you see his dates. He, he, he lived in the 19th century and during the Victorian period. That's when he came of age. And these are some of his books. Um, and uh, what Mill does is he, he picks up on uh, Bentham's original definition of happiness, but then he modifies it in order to answer one very great objection. So if you're taking notes, if you're thinking about this, you'll see in this introductory paragraph that his mentor, Jeremy Bentham, who subscribed to the greatest happiness for the greatest number, uh, associated happiness with pleasure. And this immediately, and unhappiness, of course, with pain, this immediately attracted uh, uh, one of the main criticisms against utilitarianism, and namely that it's a hedonistic doctrine, right? If you're just chasing pleasure in life, then you're a hedonist. And so that, that's not a good thing in general. We're supposedly placed on this earth for more than that. Our purposes as human beings hopefully are a little bit more elevated, a little bit more noble, a little bit more challenging than simply chasing pleasures, although all of us, of course, will prefer pleasure to pain. But if one makes one's whole life uh, a hunt for pleasure, then one definitely uh, is going to be labeled a hedonist, and that's not particularly a flattering term as we are capable of more than this. So that was one thing that Mill had to do. He had to reformulate utilitarianism in order to salvage it from that criticism that Bentham drew, and he does in the opening part of this work. So that's one thing. But notice that um, he's going to uh, be able to do this and then tell us immediately, unlike the other ethical theories we've looked at, which start with explaining what is goodness, right? And, and perhaps by, by explaining what is justice, or doing so as Plato does more or less entwined in his Republic, he gives us instead a focus on right and wrong. And we'll go both ways. From what is right, we can figure out what is good, and from what is right, we can figure out what is just. And so this principle, which is the greatest happiness principle, tells us, I'm just quoting from this opening chapter, which is not Mill's words, but they're quoting him, an action is right, insofar as it tends to promote happiness. That's the introductory paragraph. An action is right insofar as it tends to promote happiness. And it's not just for you. It's a happiness for you and those, you know, whom your, let's say, your envelope of existence embraces. So it's not just your own happiness, but your happiness and the happiness of those around you, you could say. So an action is right if it promotes happiness and wrong if it produces unhappiness, okay? Not only, again, for you, but also for others. And, and you could extend this, if you want, to the whole global village, uh, given the connectivity that exists today. So you, you, you can understand that he's speaking in a general sense. And that is the same definition that Bentham used, but there's a problem with it, and that problem is that it, it attracts accusations of hedonism. So how does Mill do? Uh, how does Mill deal with this? Well, first of all, um, he, uh, he doesn't want to um, get into this uh, question of what is good. Uh, we see that, uh, you know, from the opening paragraph here, he says, from the dawn of philosophy, the question concerning the summum bonum, or what is the same thing, the foundation of morality, has been accounted the main problem in speculative thought. And that's right. You know, this question of what is good, we've already seen various answers to this and answers, moreover, that disagree with each other on what is good and how to attain it. Plato and Aristotle don't exactly agree. Hobbes certainly disagrees with both of them. Kant, again, takes a different tack. And Mill here wants to avoid the question. 
because all he sees is warfare, at least ideational and verbal warfare among philosophers. Yeah, He says this question of what is the greatest good has occupied the most gifted intellects and divided them into schools and sects, carrying on a vigorous warfare against one another. After more than 2,000 years, he says, the same discussions continue and philosophers are still not in agreement. And, and that's absolutely right. So he wants to avoid, that's why Mill is more interested in avoiding this question about what is good and instead saying what is right. And that will therefore in some way entail goodness without having to get into this trap of the disagreements among so many philosophical schools. So that's Mill's strategy for tackling what is right and wrong in the first instance. So he just says a bit here, you know, that we can't prove things when it comes to ultimate ends, such as ultimate goodness. For example, he says, uh, whatever can be proved to be good must be so by being shown to be a means to something admitted to be good without proof. For example, the medical art is proved to be good by its conducing to health. But how is it possible to prove that health is good? It seems a, a thing that we take for granted. We accept that health is good without argumentation, and we accept that, that not being in good health is not good without argumentation, and medical arts and sciences are, are good because they restore health, right? But we don't ever have to argue that health is good. You see? So he's going to avoid some of the thorny debates about goodness and focus instead on this notion of acting in such a way as to promote the greatest possible happiness, and that will be right action. And pleasure is going to be a kind of synonym. But Mill, again, has to address this problem that Bentham experienced, all right? And we're going to see how he does it. And he does it in chapter 2. Uh, the foundation of this greatest happiness principle, and here's his definition. That actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, and wrong as they tend to promote the reverse of happiness, all right? By happiness is intended pleasure and the absence of pain. By unhappiness, pain and the privation of pleasure. So fair enough, and that was Bentham's definition as well. So he now addresses the criticism that was levied at his great mentor Bentham, and it goes as follows. Such a theory of life, Mill says, excites in many minds among them in some of the most estimable in feeling and purpose, inveterate dislike. To suppose that life has, as they express it, no higher end than pleasure, no better and nobler object of desire and pursuit, they designate as utterly mean and groveling, as a doctrine worthy only of swine, to whom the followers of Epicurus were at a very early period contemptuously likened. And modern holders of the doctrine are occasionally made the subject of equally polite comparisons by its German, French, and English assailants. So Epicurus, who, with whom we associate the bumper sticker, eat, drink, and be merry, uh, for tomorrow we die, um, is not fair entirely either, because he was not uh, a purely hedonist either. But he, Mill is saying that this is what the definition has reminded people of, uh, that that if you th if you say that you believe in the greatest happiness principle, you're going to be critiqued um, as being someone who merely chases pleasure, just as as an animal might chase pleasure, and fail therefore to express the nobler sides of humanity. And Mill says this critique is not justified, and and he explains it in the following way. By the way, there's an English irony in here. Um, English is very dry. Uh, in, in, when used by the English writers. Uh, American English is not as dry. It used to be Mark Twain and some of the uh, writers of that period in America were also very dry by today's comparison. So it may completely slip by you that Mill is being extremely sarcastic when he says uh, modern holders of the doctrine, that is of utilitarianism, are occasionally made the subject of equally polite comparisons it, being compared to swine right? Mill is saying equally polite, but he really means, of course, it's incredibly rude, yes? So that's a bit of dry English humor for you. All right, so here's the answer. When thus attacked, the Epicureans have always answered that it is not they but their accusers who represent human nature in a degrading light, since the, ac the accusation supposes human beings to be capable of no pleasures except those of which swine are capable. 
So in other words, if you point the finger at a utilitarian and say, well, if you are seeking the greatest happiness for the greatest number, you're just behaving like a swine, then the rebuttal of that accusation is you say to the accuser, well, how, why would you suppose that, hu- that happiness for a human being is, is no different than happiness for a pig? Why are you supposing that? Aren't you, therefore, by attacking this doctrine, are, are confessing that you see human beings as no better than swine? So you see, they turn the tables, at least Mill turns the tables on the accuser, as the Epicureans did in their own way, by saying that humans are capable of pleasures that other animals are not capable of. And those are the kinds of pleasures that we really focus on, because the ones that bring lasting happiness as Mill will go on to explain, are not the kinds of pleasures that a pig might experience wallowing in the mud. Okay, is this clear so far? That we're capable, therefore, of something different from the animals. We certainly, and there's no denying that we experience animal pleasures, but we also experience other pleasures, and Mill will call them higher pleasures. And I hope you experience them too. Obviously, as a human, you do. And those are the kinds of things which, moreover, says Mill, would bring lasting happiness. So we have to distinguish, therefore, between pleasures of lower and higher value right, in terms of their quality. And so it's the qualitative pleasures that Mill wants to focus on, not merely the quantitative pleasures. Is this clear? It is very important because humans can, can experience this. We, we obviously can experience the, 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 you know, the pleasures of a beast because we have an animal side, but the beasts cannot experience the pleasures of art, the pleasures of music, the pleasures of cuisine, the pleasures of dance, the pleasures of philosophy, if that's pleasurable to you in any way it is to me, or, or indeed the pleasures that are bequeathed to us, at least in potential, by our tremendous noetic, that is, powers of mind, our intellectual and philosophical powers uh, and consciousness itself is of a different order in human beings on a good day, and therefore bequeaths to us the ability to experience happiness of a kind and a more lasting kind than other animals uh, would be able to given their state of sentience. And this is what Mill wants to say. And it becomes particularly poignant if you think about Darwin. So I mentioned to you, you know, Darwin is uh, at the same time. Uh, Darwin Darwin was, uh, was publishing on the origin of species, and it was a horrifying thing for the English to read Darwin uh, who said quite plainly that we're descended from apes. I mean, they're our closest living relatives. And uh, there's a very famous quote. I don't know if you know this, but the wife of the Bishop of Worcester, she heard about this. It caused a huge furor, especially in religious circles, because if you believe literally in the book of Genesis, then you it's going to be hard to juxtapose belief that God created the world in six days with the theory of evolution, which tells us that life evolved over millions and millions of years. So Darwin really shook the tree um, of the uh, creationist view of things. And he also really put people in their place. That wasn't his goal. But uh, it made us a little more humble to know that we may be descended from apes uh, and that God didn't fashion us in his own image. That's a different kind of narrative, right? So the wife of the Bishop of Worcester, when reading Darwin, said, descended from apes, I'm quoting her, she said, descended from apes, let's hope that it is not true. She said, but if it's true, let's pray that it does not become generally known. (laughs) She was worried that that if it were true, it became generally known that humans would suddenly see themselves in quite a devalued light. So I think that Mill's focus, if you want to relate it to Darwin, whose theories were scandalizing society at the same time, then in that light, Mill's focus on the qualitative pleasures that humans can experience over the quantitative pleasures of beasts is a, is a much more important focus, yes? Because it also provides, uh, in a way, a kind of a balm to the shock of, of Darwin's uh, hypothesis that we are descended from apes, and indeed we are, right? We're apparently 99% alike to chimpanzees in our DNA, but that 1% makes a huge difference because chimpanzees don't compose symphonies, and we do, and that little bit of DNA makes, you know, that, that, that tiny, relatively speaking, tiny, say, quantitative difference in our genome makes a huge qualitative difference 
in our use of language and ideas and arts and other things. And that's what Mill wants to focus on. Okay, so this becomes a very interesting and very rich topic. Um, and, uh, but primarily, he, he wants to advocate a theory of morals. And so here is where um, he goes on to explain that some kinds of pleasures are more desirable or more valuable than others. It would be absurd, he says, that while in estimating all other things, quality is considered as well as quantity, the estimation of pleasure should be supposed to depend on quantity alone. So it doesn't mean uh, that just because you had a very large meal that you had a good meal. Just because you ate a lot of food doesn't mean that it was a good meal, right? You might, in fact, prefer to have very small portions of exquisitely delicious food rather than have an absolutely enormous portion of, of maybe not so well-prepared food. So that would be a distinction you would make then between quality and quantity. And quantity of pleasure, says Mill, is not the most important thing to us. It's quality of pleasure. And the most long-lasting pleasures are going to be quality of pleasure. And so he says of two pleasures, of these two, roughly distinguished as quantitative and qualitative, if there be one to which almost, to all or almost all of experience of both give a decided preference, irrespective of any feeling of moral obligation to prefer it, that is the most desirable pleasure. So notice he is saying that really in order to be able to judge, so you could say there's a devil's advocacy going on here, because Mill is saying, hey, if you want to really be able to tell the difference, you obviously have to experience both. So he's not telling you to refrain from quantitative pleasures or the pleasures of the beasts. He's saying if you really want to know the difference, you obviously need to have experienced both. And then you'll know, and then you can judge for yourself. And that leads him to an interesting conclusion. This always stimulates a uh, discussion in the class, so I'm prepared here to ask Mill's question to you. He supposes, for the sake of argument, and again, I'm going to ask you in a moment whether you have any preference uh, other than being human. Mill, Mill supposes, he says, few human creatures would consent to be changed into any of the lower animals for a promise of the fullest allowance of a beast's pleasures. <laughs> he supposes this, that if you've experienced at least some of the qualitative pleasures, you wouldn't want to be an animal, even if you could have a perfect life of an animal. Mill says, no intelligent human being would consent to be a fool. No instructed person would be an ignoramus. No person of feeling and conscience would be selfish and base, even though they should be persuaded that the fool, the dunce, or the rascal is better satisfied with his lot than they are with theirs. So does anyone, I'm going to stop the share for a moment and ask you, uh, would, would any of you um, rather be some other animal? I mean, that's Mill's question. He's supposing you wouldn't if you've experienced the pleasures, the full range of pleasures that humans can experience qualitatively as well as quantitatively. He says few. He says, maybe there's always one. I've, I've always found uh, in a class this size, there are going to be one or more people who, who would actually buy into being a, another animal. I would prefer to be some other animal rather than human. Uh, don't be afraid. It's that I'm not taking a test, and I'm not going to you know, post it on social media. But I've heard some interesting suggestions from some students in the past. So in, when this question comes up, is there any other animal you'd rather be? If you could have a great life, you know, as far as that animal goes, uh, rather than, you know, like maybe a difficult or challenging life as a human, some people are tempted. Um, so a bird would be nice. <laughs> yeah, Randy, you could fly. Sure. That's why we invented airplanes, right? We looked at the birds. We said, we want to do this too. So we've been fascinated with flying because birds definitely have attracted us. A big blue whale. Yeah, that'd be great unless you were harpooned. Uh, uh, you know, it wouldn't be so great to be reduced to blubber. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, a whale might be nice. Uh, it'd be the biggest animal on earth. Um, that could be interesting, Rachel, I grant you. Um, some other people have expressed preferences for uh, a tiger or an elephant. Oh, okay. But are you saying this just because these are, I mean, by and large, you're naming intelligent animals, right? Many birds are very intelligent. Uh, wet whales and, and other cetaceans are definitely uh, among the biggest brain of, of, of animals. Um, and um, a dolphin's very intelligent. A house cat, okay. Some people also say lap dog. But are you really, are you really, would you really be willing to cash that in? I mean, if somebody offered you a pill today and said, you know, here, if you take this pill, you'll be changed into a house cat, 
Would you really go for it? You would. Okay. Well, as I said, there's always someone who'd prefer to be a different animal. But um, if you want to read a story about this, uh, this, is, this is something that's played out in fiction. There's a wonderful story. I'll type it in. The Once and Future King. Maybe some of you have read it. It's a delightful story uh, by T.H. White. And I think it's W-H-Y-T-E. I might be mistaken. Um, and this is a beautiful story about Camelot. Uh, it's a lovely story about uh, Guinevere and Lancelot and King Arthur, and it's not a true story, but it's a beautiful fictional account of the Mort d'Arthur and in the English language. And uh, in part of it, you know, young King Arthur, when he's in training, he doesn't know he's going to pull the sword from the stone. If you know the story, he doesn't know this. He doesn't know he's going to be king, but he's being educated by a wizard named Merlin. And at one point in his education, Merlin transforms him into different animals. So he can actually experience life as a trout, as a, a raptor, as an ant. He, he experiences all these different kinds of animals, and then Merlin always changes them back. But it's to teach him a lesson about how much better it is to be human. So I, I think T.H. White must have read Utilitarianism and probably agreed with John Stuart Mill. So um, you don't want to regret it, okay? Yeah, being a human is too stressful. Okay, well, some people would say that. But Mill always thinks that if you overcome the stresses, and this is what I want you to think about, if you overcome the stresses of being human and the challenges of being human, then you do get to a place where at the end of the day, you're, you're very grateful and lucky. You consider yourself fortunate to have a human birth and not to be born as one of these other animals which basically at any time could become lunch for some predator and which in any case have much shorter life expectancies. Uh, even if you're a lap dog or a pampered house cat, you're not going to live more than a dozen years, more or less. Yeah. And what, what you're going to be able to experience in terms of pleasure is going to be much more limited. Of course, you wouldn't know that if your consciousness were a consciousness of that one of these animals possessed. In a sense, you'd never know what you're missing. But we as humans can know and do know. So I think Mill is, is probably right. If we took a survey over the years, I'd say that most students uh, would agree that they're um, probably in the long run better off being humans. Um, although, indeed, it's possible to wish uh, perhaps to be relieved of some of the stresses. Nonetheless, I think we can uh, take Mill's point. Uh, and it, the, the conclusion is given below. He says that um, it is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Why? Because a human being dissatisfied can work toward more satisfaction in life. And if you attain the satisfaction of a human being, you would never cash that in for the satisfaction of a pig. That's Mill's point, okay? Better to be Socrates dissatisfied, he goes on, better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. And he says, if the fool or the pig are of a different opinion, in other words, the fool says, no, I'm ha I like being a fool, you know, I have no responsibility. And the pig says, no, I like being a pig, I can just wallow in the mud all day. If they're of a different opinion, Mill says, it's because they only know their own side of the question. So in other words, the fool can never know what it's like to be wise, and the, the pig can never know what it's like to be human. So the other party to the comparison knows both sides. If you prefer to be a human being dissatisfied to a pig satisfied, if you prefer to be Socrates dissatisfied to a fool satisfied, it's because you have some inkling of the possibility of the qualitative satisfactions that you could attain in life, and therefore you're going to strive to attain them. And that happiness, therefore, that flows from it will be of a greater quality and much longer lived than the pleasures of a beast. And that's Mill's point. Right? So the greatest happiness for the greatest number could never be that we all just turn ourselves into pigs or house cats uh, and are satisfied with that. Um, but but there's, a, there's, of course, a caveat to this. And the caveat is highlighted here. Capacity for noble feelings. I mean, how do we, let us say, develop this capacity 
Uh, when we're younger, we don't because it takes us a long time to mature as a species. This big brain uh, takes quite a while to become neurologically mature and then to become developed. That's why we spend more and more time in school, right? I mean, education is a huge part of life and, and necessarily so. So Mill is aware of this. He says capacity for the noble of feelings is in most natures a very tender plant easily killed, not only by hostile influences, but by mere want of sustenance. And in the majority of young persons, it speedily dies away if the occupations to which their position in life has devoted them and the society into which it has thrown them are not favorable to keeping that higher capacity in exercise. So here, this is Mill's critique. It's a gentle, not a savage critique, but it's a very direct critique of the inequities of the class system that pervaded English society at the time, so that a child born into the lower classes might be put to work in a mine or a factory at the age of eight or nine or ten and never have an education. And therefore, that capacity for noble, nobler feelings would, in fact, be preempted by a very cruel and harsh kind of life experience. And this would therefore condemn that person with, if they had no opportunity in life to a level of existence which would be unhappy. And so what Mill is clearly arguing for is, as you can see between the lines, a much more equitable distribution of opportunity to society and particularly for young people to have a chance for better education. And th this is exactly the time period in which one of the most famous public institutions in England, uh, namely University College London, the flagship of, of the University of London, which is a parallel to CUNY, interesting parallel, you know, City College is the flagship of CUNY, right? City College was founded in 1847 and uh, CUNY much, much later, more than a century later. So we're the flagship. And similarly in London, the great University of London, which has LSE and, uh, and Imperial College and you know, many other, many other great colleges, uh, its flagship is University College. And the spiritual father of that place was Jeremy Bentham. Uh, I actually did my PhD there, as it happens. Uh, much later, of course. I'm not as old as these guys, but uh, I did my PhD at University College London. I'm very proud of that fact. And in university, around the time that Mill is writing this, right around the time that Mill is writing this book, I think it's 1867, more or less, utilitarianism emerges from the press. That was the, around the same period of time that University College itself opened its doors for the first time to women, to Catholics, to Jews, and to political dissenters in general. So it ceased to be, again, a uniquely uh, restricted institution to the Anglican you know, populace and became much more what we would today call inclusive and diverse, right? It opened its, door, it opened its doors. And so uh, that is in response to this groundswell of desire for social and political change that was taking place at Mill's time and in which Mill had such a big stake. So he's really saying that we have to start this process early, that you can't give liberty to people who don't have education because it's not going to help them. What they need is to have, quote unquote, the capacity for nobler feelings cultivated from a very early age. And this can only happen if people are exposed to a chance to be what we would say in uh, colloquial army advertisement today, all that you can be. That used to be an army slogan uh, for recruitment. Be all that you can be. And Mill wants us to be all that we can be. And he, he's not advocating that we join the army. He's not advocating that we don't. He's saying that education is the beginning of it. And so like Aristotle, you remember, Aristotle also said, education makes all the difference in life. What happens to us in our formative years is going to set the tone. For, for the virtues or vices we acquire. And in Mill's view, it's not that different. Mill is saying, if we have a, a decent education, then we will have a chance to cultivate that very tender plant of capacity for nobler feelings. And that in turn will allow us to experience the qualitative pleasures in life as humans can, and that will therefore lead to a higher quality of happiness. 
Okay, so you see the picture. You see how this is emerging now as a doctrine of, uh, of justice, basically, with this goal of the greatest happiness for the greatest number. All right, are there any questions about that? Any questions about, about that so far? Um, how related was the publishment of this piece and the London School opening up to more uh, people? Oh, was there a direct, you're asking me if there's a direct connection? Yeah, was there? Oh, what a great, that's a great a question. And I'm, I'm hand waving because I'm not sure. I'm not an historian and I don't claim to be. I just know from, you know, what I picked up in the air. Uh, and when, when I was at University College London, I was naturally informed in their own literature about their history. Um, so I knew that they were the first to admit women, Jews, Catholics, you know, people who were who were not part of the at that time the majority Anglican population. Um, whether whether uh, this was a direct result, whether I I never read the meeting of the you know of the actual university uh, assembly that made that change that enacted that change. But I will tell you this, and Ruby, it's Ruby, right? You could look into it. OK, without any difficulty, because it's all online. But I'll tell you a very true story. Uh, and, and, and that is that Jeremy Bentham is regarded as the spiritual father of University College London. Uh, and he, in fact, his statue was in the not his statue, but his uh, an, an effigy of him was located in the cloisters of University College when I was there. It was only removed in recent years, and it saddened me. But when I was a student there, there was literally a carriage on wheels in the corner of one of the cloisters. And you can see pictures of it online. And inside that carriage, you can look in the window, and there was Jeremy Bentham, an effigy of Jeremy Bentham, dressed up in his, in his clothes and sitting at his desk writing, you know, with a quill pen. And his will is in the window, and it says that every year... The carriage is to be wheeled to the, into the opening of the university senate. He, he, the carriage is wheeled into the... The British are very eccentric, right? So they, they re, did this. They honored his will. And every year when the senate, university senate met for the first time, they would wheel the carriage in. And, uh, and, and Bentham said he is to be recorded as present but not voting. And it's true, and it's true, and they did this for 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 more than for I, maybe almost two centuries. They wheeled him in, and they recorded him as present, but not voting. So that's a that's a a connection uh, between the influence that Bentham had and the reforms that took place in the in the college. And Mill was his successor, who again answered the critiques that were levied against Bentham. So I'm pretty sure that Mill had a hand in this, one way or another. Uh, but, you know, I haven't read the actual minutes of the meeting where they said, OK, now we're going to open the college to, you know, women or open the college to Catholics. Now, I haven't read that in the actual history of the college, but I know they were the first to do it. So that was part of the ferment of the times. And uh, and, and so I'm, I'm glad you're interested in this. And you can all uh, you can research this very easily if you if you want to pursue it more more deeply. And I urge you to. So anyway, that's a little anecdote about Bentham and uh, University College London. Uh, true story. Uh, nowadays, they removed. It's all gone now. I was I was back there a couple of years ago. I always used to go visit him, and I, when I'm in London, and I went back there, and they removed it. I was very. I wanted to protest. I wanted to write a letter and say, "What did you do?" You know. And and the only trace of him now across the street from the college is a tavern called Je a pub. It's called Jeremy Bentham. You know. So he's now he's now kind of been demoted to a pub. Um, and OK, so at least people know his name, but it's quite a demotion. <laughs> I think it's ironic, too, um, given given the brand of utilitarianism that he was promoting about pleasure being the measure of happiness. And now they've named a pub after him. I mean, you know, what an irony, right? OK, so enough of that digression. And enough of the uh, English culture is so eccentric. You really have to love it. They're very eccentric. So now what I wanted to say to you is uh, that there's another charge. Now we have to consider, so you understand how Mill has taken pains to distinguish between nobler and baser pleasures to refute that charge that, uh, that utilitarianism is only hedonism. Okay, so consider uh, for a moment that that's amply refuted. Again, read Mill in depth. 
But now there's a second charge and a more serious one. In our day, I think it's a much more serious charge. Since we're a culture of narcissists and hedonists anyway, nobody really pays much attention to that part of me. I'm being a little bit, a little bit uh, sarcastic. But, but there's a more serious charge that can be leveled, and I'm going to level it now. And this is the second of three big objections that can be made. And that's why Mills on Liberty becomes so important in light of this second charge. Okay, And the second charge is as follows that utilitarianism, I'm going to type this in, utilitarianism, it can be critiqued and has been critiqued, does not respect individual rights. This is a much more serious allegation. It has been and can be decreed, uh, it can be critiqued that utilitarianism in its very formulation is potentially going to lend itself to all kinds of injustice because of the following. If you are trying to promote the greatest happiness for the greatest number, and if you're saying, as Mill argues, that, that uh, to a very large extent, uh, justice will consist of the greatest happiness for the greatest number. That's what we are sh striving for socially and politically. But then you could ask the following question, and you should, and as a philosopher, certainly you would. Uh, what, what about the smallest number? Excuse me. We're talking about the greatest happiness for the greatest number. What if the greatest happiness for the greatest number happens to lead also at the same time to the greatest unhappiness for the smallest number. How could that be just? In other words, suppose I'm just being hypothetical. I'm not saying Mill advocated this. He didn't. That's why he answered it with another book on liberty. But suppose if you wanted to make this criticism, uh, if you hadn't read Mill, you would say, well, if you're just aiming for the greatest happiness for the greatest number, you could achieve that. But then what about the smallest number, what if a majority, for example, is oppressing a minority within society or a given society? And let's say the, the, the majority is happy with that, right? The majority thinks this is great. Okay, we're all happy. But at the same time, the greatest happiness comes at the corollary cost of unhappiness for a certain number of people within. Um, let's say a minority of people within are made very unhappy by the same thing that makes the majority happy. So utilitarianism, therefore, if that's what utilitarianism is, it could attain the goal of the greatest happiness for the greatest number, but it would not be respecting individual rights because it could easily oppress others within that society. And uh, the majority is still happy, right? So you've satisfied the utilitarian formula. But you never said what w was happening to the smallest number. So how can that be just? Well, the answer is that it can't be just. And Mill is fully aware of this. He's not trying to promote that. So he has to write another book. <laughs> he has to write a whole... This is such an important issue that Mill writes the most brilliant essay in defense of individual liberty to argue that in tandem with utilitarianism, you can never oppress anybody, that every individual has a right not to be harmed within a just society. You cannot do harm to anyone. And so if you're harming people, obviously you're not making them happy. And so it becomes a duty of the majority to make sure that no one's harmed. And that is what he goes into in depth in his essay. So this will answer that charge. Because you could imagine in everyday life, we get these kinds of scenarios. Look, uh, let's say you're, you're, I mean, here's a maybe a crazy hypothetical example, but it should bring the point home to you. Let's say you're shipwrecked. Let's say you have a life raft, and it, the life raft can hold 10 people, you know, safely, without capsizing or, or, or you know, sinking. Let's say there's 11 people in the water, and the raft can only hold 10 people. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? So the first 10 people who get into the raft, they're fine. Right? They're in the raft. Right? They got, they're, they're saved. Okay, so they're happy. It's the greatest happiness for the greatest number. But the 11th person who's in the water is not happy, right? Because they're shark food or they're, you know, they're freezing. 
And so that's that's you know the criticism is, but that's utilitarian. The greatest hop in is for the greatest number. You got you know ten of eleven people in the raft. Hey, it's as good as it gets, right? What about the eleventh person in the water? What are you going to do about them? Mill's solution to this problem would be that you have to not have the happiness of ten people at the expense of the unhappiness of one that can never be just. What Mill would propose, I'm assuming, in a hypothetical case like this is that you would rotate. You would take turns going into the water. So you would have, therefore, 10 out of 11 people always experiencing the greatest happiness in that scenario. And you're going to have some one person who, who's going to be in the water at a time, but it's never going to be one person who's victimized by the other 10. There's going to be some fair way to share the necessary, you, you would say, in such a scenario, one person is necessarily going to be less happy than the others being in the water, let's say, and being exposed to, you know, potentially hypothermia or sharks or whatever. So you share the load in that way by rotating the time. That way. It's like sharing, you know, a resource. And that way nobody is marginalized. And that would be exactly in line with Mill's theory of liberty that we cannot harm people. The name Ruby is, as I typed it in before, and it's in your Google Drive folder, it's called On Liberty. Okay, On Liberty. Okay. Now, there's a really great story to illustrate this. And this is a short story, which is also in your Google Drive folder. Ursula Le Guin, I'm sure some of you have read uh, Ursula Le Guin. Has, has any of you read her? Any, read, anybody read anything by her? You'll find a story in there. Well, it might, you might want to read this. If you're interested in utilitarianism, and so far I think you are, some of you, then you want to read this story. It's in your folder. I'll type it in. It's called The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. It's a fictitious place. Okay, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas by Ursula Le Guin. I uploaded it in your folder. You'll find it in there. And what is It's a short story, and it's a, it's a savage critique of exactly this. I'm not going to spoil it for you. But Omelas on the surface is just, it's a little utopian town. Okay, everything's perfect, except for one thing. There's one thing. Everyone's happiness and, and, the, and the perfectness of this place depends on one thing that is it's a horrible secret, and those who discover the secret can't stand it, and they leave. Okay, those the ones who walk away. Um, so it's it's Ursula Le Guin's way of calling attention to the same potential defect of the greatest happiness principle, that to assert and to strive for the greatest happiness of the greatest number never says what's going to happen to the smallest number. Right. So that's why Mill wrote on liberty. I, I cannot overemphasize the importance of this. So by upholding. Uh, and I'll show you in a moment the salient part, okay? And then remember, again, to answer this critique, the third thing, all right, is that there has to be equal rights for women, says Mill. That's the third book, The Subjection of Women. And again, if you came in late, um, the, and that's also in your Google Drive folders, I've uploaded On Liberty and The Subjection of Women, because to understand Mill, it's really important to string these three different pieces together and that's the only way to make his utilitarian formula just, because he's going to answer the problem of individual liberty in the essay, and he's going to answer the other problem that in his day women still didn't have anything close to equal rights. So he says, but women have to have equal rights. They're more than half the population. How are you ever going to have the greatest happiness for the greatest number if you marginalize 54% of the population? That's ridiculous. Women are usually about 52 to 54% of the population. So Mill would say but that's impossible. Therefore, women have to have the same rights. And therefore, you can achieve the greatest happiness principle. You see? So it's all connected. It's essential to understand Mill. Is the subjection of women a response to the third main argument? Uh, it's it's a response to, uh, I've only given you two, or I, I don't know which argument, Ruby, you're asking me about. Now, I've given you two objections. The first one's the hedonism objection. The second one is the equal rights, is the, you know, the minority being oppressed objection. 
And so the subjection of women is a, res is a response to actually a response to that objection, that number two, because, it, it, you know, in this case, it's actually a majority that's being oppressed, not a minority. Women are a majority in society, slight majority, right? Usually more than half. And so the greatest, ha Mill is saying, how could the greatest happiness of the, for the greatest number go through if, if half that number or more than half that number doesn't have the same rights as the others? Okay, so it's a response to the second objection. All right. And the, just so on liberty and the subjection of women are both responses to that objection, that the greatest happiness for the greatest number uh, cannot be oppressing anybody and be a formula for justice. The third objection, um, I mentioned three objections. The third objection is that uh, actually uh, part of the problem with teleology, these theories where the rightness or wrongness of an action depends on the outcome, and this is a tele utilitarianism is therefore not deontological, it's not based on principles, uh, or, or rather uh, rules, it's based on outcomes, yeah? it's based on outcomes, so if you got a good outcome, you did the right thing, if you got a bad outcome, you did the wrong thing, so the problem with that is that we cannot predict the future, and this is the third uh, objection that can be and has been levied against utilitarian theories and more generally against teleological theories is that policies often have unintended consequences. Yes? None of us has a crystal ball. Our politicians in particular don't have crystal balls and they, they are uh, not able, no one, none of us is able really to know in advance what the effect of a policy is going to be. Although sometimes it's easier to see uh, the bad effects from bad policies coming sooner. Uh, but nonetheless, um, if you're ideologically driven, you're not even going to look. Uh, so the problem is that you could implement a policy that you may be in love with for one reason or another. It may lead to a disaster. Um, and only then would a utilitarian say, we well, did the wrong thing because you've increased unhappiness. Yeah, But none of us knows in advance for sure when we, let's say, implement a policy or vote for a particular person who's supposedly going to implement those policies, we don't really know what the outcome is going to be. We can imagine or we can suppose, hypothesize, but uh, we can't really know if we're doing the right thing until we get the outcome. And that's certainly, that's a bit weird, right? Like you think you're doing the right thing, but you don't really know. It's like gambling on fourth down. Those of you who are football fans, you'll get this right away. If you gamble on fourth down, uh, was it a right? Is it right or wrong to gamble on fourth down? Well, the commentators always say, well, if you, if you made it, you go, it was the right call, right? If you gambled and won, you did the right thing. If you gambled and lost, you should have punted, right? That's what, that's what they're all going to say. It's totally teleological. Yeah, if you got the outcome you desired, then you made the right call. If you got the outcome you didn't desire, you made the wrong call. Is that clear? Yeah? Clear about that? Are there any other questions about this? I just want to give you a snippet of, from On Liberty before we uh, wrap up today, uh, just to underscore the importance of the juxtaposition of Mill's utilitarianism with his ardent defense of individual liberties. This is really important. So I want to do that quickly. And of course, we'll continue. As you see, Mitch, Mill is very rich, and there's a lot here that, that can be shared. But I just want you to know, uh, before we wrap it up today, what his domain of liberty is. It's absolutely uh, enlightened for his time, certainly. The, the kinds of things that he was advocating were not widespread, were not in place. And this is an extract. Um, I want you to see what comes before this. Um, he says, and this is called the harm principle. This is in the essay. You'll find it. It's in your readings. The object of this essay, he says, he doesn't say it off the top, but he comes on to say it, is to assert one very simple principle as entitled to govern absolutely the dealings of society with the individual by way of compulsion and control, whether the means used be physical force in the term of legal penalties or the moral coercion of public opinion. 1859, he's writing this. The principle is that the sole end for which mankind are warranted, in other words, justified, individually or collectively in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection. 
The only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. That's the only justification we have. If you're harming other people, we are definitely justified in stopping you. All right? That's for sure. If you have harmed somebody, we're definitely justified in, in, in indicting you if we have evidence that you've harmed. You know, if we have evidence you're going to harm, if we catch you in the act of harming. If you're inflicting harms on other people, says Mill, then a civilized society and a good government will have the duty to prevent you from, from doing more harms or prevent you from doing the harms you're presently doing. That's the only justification. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. He cannot rightfully be compelled to do or forbear because it will be better for him, because it will make him happier, or because in the opinions of others, to do so would be wise or even right. There are good reasons for remonstrating with him, or reasoning with him, or persuading him, or entreating him, but not for compelling him, or visiting him with any evil in case you do otherwise. So in other words, you may have a different opinion from others. You may have a different religion from others. You may decide to dress differently from others. You may have a, ge a different gender identity from others. You may have all kinds of ways in which you differ from others. But Mill says if you're not harming anybody, then nobody has any right to interfere with your liberty to behave in the way you wish to behave and to say what you wish to say or to think what you wish to think. If you're not harming anybody, the state has no business interfering with you. That's called the harm principle. And he concludes, this is an astonishing thing. At the bottom of that paragraph, he says, over himself, his own mind and body, the individual is sovereign. You are the ruler of your mind and body. Nobody else. You. Each individual in, in society is the ruler of their own mind and body. Okay? That's very clear. All right? And what kinds of liberties does he grant? As long as you're not harming anybody... What is he saying? What is he saying you, you, you should be free to do? He goes justifying utility here too, but what about liberty? This is the, the core. This is the region of human liberty, says Mill. It comprises first the inward domain of consciousness. So you're free. Your mind has to be totally free from coercion. No one's allowed to brainwash you. No one's allowed to propagandize you. No one's allowed to indoctrinate you. Liberty of thought and feeling, absolute freedom of opinion and sentiment on all subjects, practical or speculative, scientific, moral or theological. This is like our First Amendment on steroids, right? Basically, it is, it is absolute and total freedom of thinking and freedom of having whatever opinions you want to have as long as you're not harming anybody, as long as you're not harming anybody. Is this clear? On any issue, you can have whatever scientific opinion you want, whatever moral opinion you want, whatever theological opinion you want. That is your absolute right. Secondly, the liberty of expressing and publishing opinions may seem to fall under a different principle, he says, but they're the same. You have exactly the same liberty of, in other words, freedom of expression, what we call in our First Amendment freedom of expression and freedom of publication. No books can be censored. No ideas can be censored. No person can be canceled just because they have a different view. And thirdly, well, for, and secondly, really, because for him, freedom of expression is the same as freedom of thinking. It's just a result, right? One is a result of the other. And secondly, he says, this freedom, this liberty entails liberty of taste and pursuits, of framing the plan of our life to suit our own character, of doing as we like, subject to such consequences as may follow without impediment from our fellow creatures, so long as we what we do does not harm them. So you can do whatever you like, says Mill, as long as you don't harm anybody. And even though they should think, he says, that our conduct is foolish, perverse, or wrong, that's their entitlement. You know, I can look at you and say, you know, I think you're a pervert. Okay, that's my opinion, and I'm entitled to it too. But if you are not harming anybody, then my opinion doesn't count. As far as you're concerned, your opinion counts as long as you're not harming anybody. I can say what I like about you, but I can't stop you from doing what you're doing as long as you're not harming anybody. I have no right to do that. So, you you know, our, our fellow creatures may think us foolish, perverse, or wrong for framing our plan of life the way we do, but, in fact, they are not warranted to physically stop us if we're not harming anybody. And thirdly, from this liberty follows the liberty within the same limits of combination of individuals. In other words, freedom to unite, 
for any purpose not involving harm to others. You want to march for a cause peaceably? You have the right to do it. Whatever the cause, as long as you're not harming anybody. It's not the case that some people are allowed to march and others aren't. If you're not harming anybody, you all have the right to march. So that is really pretty much an extremely enlightened view, yes, of what we would today consider to be inalienable rights. And that comes from John Stuart Mill. So if your thoughts harm someone, well, Randy, how can you harm someone by thinking? If you plan a premeditated murder, yes, that would, and then you actually executed it, that would be then something that could be punished by law, but would only be the fact of what you did. It would not be your thinking. Yes? Uh, well, this is a really good question, a, a private question, but I'm going to address it publicly. Um, Mill promotes the idea of abortion. This is an interesting question because he didn't really say so. He doesn't discuss abortion because in those days, remember something, in the 1850s, abortion was a hugely dangerous thing. Okay, It wasn't sanctioned at all. It was going to be done probably in a back alley with a coat hanger. Uh, totally, totally medically dangerous, hugely dangerous to the mother. So probably done only as a drastic measure. Uh, if we fast forward where medical science has advanced to the state where it has now, it would be consistent, regardless of what you believe or not, of answering for Mill. I have to answer for him. He can't answer for himself. When Mill says, over your mind and body, you're sovereign, if you're sovereign over your body, then that would imply that you have the right to do what you want with your body. Wouldn't it? That's on the one hand. So that would be an argument that what Mill is doing, then you could interpret as being obviously pro-choice. But wait a second, on the other hand, what about the, uh, what about the fetus? <laughs> this is a tricky, this is then tricky because if a fetus is a person, then the fetus is also sovereign over its mind and body, even though it's in utero. So then wouldn't it be doing a harm to the fetus to abort it? Well, yeah, you're killing it. And then wouldn't that be, therefore, a violation of the harm principle? That would depend on whether you accord the fetus the same rights as, a, as a, someone is born. And that's how the Supreme Court went when, in Roe v. Wade, right? It's a complicated debate. But Roe v. Wade says, well, wait a second. Everybody has rights, but they have to be born first. <laughs> so that's how Roe v. Wade finessed the question, okay? So what I'm saying is that Mill didn't discuss abortion directly. And you would have to, therefore, interpret this phrase, this very important sentence of Mill, that over you know, your own body and mind you're sovereign, and ask whether that applies to the unborn or not. That's still an unresolved debate, okay? But a great question. I'm glad you're thinking about these things, and I'm also glad you're realizing that how much, Mill, uh, how much Mill's thesis about freedom, uh, individual liberties, applies to today in particular. Mill would say the majority has no right to condemn somebody who has a different opinion. The cancel culture is totally unjustified on this view. Um, whether a majority believes something or a minority believes something, uh, you're all free to express yourselves, regardless of whether everybody agrees or everybody disagrees. That's not the point. The point is you have the liberty, or you should have the liberty to express yourself, as long as you're not harming others. Even if other people think you're wrong or foolish or perverse, says Mill. That's their opinion. They're entitled to it. You're still entitled to your opinion. If you love liberty, you're going to love Mill. Okay, if you think that's a problem, then you're going to have a problem with Mill. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for your wonderful engagement today. And um, well, uh, fetus doesn't have mind and body. Well, I mean, you know, excuse me, of course it has a body uh, <laughs> or they couldn't abort it. Uh, does it have a mind? Well, again, I could take the other side of this and say it obviously has consciousness. Uh, because it can be influenced by uh, by what's going on in its environment. So this is, listen, this is an impossible question. And you know that whatever the Supreme Court decides, half of our country will disagree, right? I mean, this is, this is one of the toughest questions of our times. So uh, I'm going to leave it there. But uh, I'm glad that Mill is making you think. And all these push-button social issues nowadays are issues that Mill discusses. So I hope you'll read him. And we're going to cover, in my group, we'll go more into depth about utilitarianism. Specifically, we're going to On Liberty in more depth. And also, we're going to look at the subjection of women. And, of course, his defense of uh, immediate and full rights for women. Okay? So, have a good day. Read Mill. And uh, I think you'll find him very, very thought-provoking and also, obviously, very relevant to our own times. 
Okay, so enjoy, Mill, this week, and I will see some of you on Thursday. The rest of you, enjoy your breakout lectures. All right, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye for now.